Now, what we have seen, I think, is is evidence of a sort of shifting culture, which is becoming less tolerant of infections. And maybe it's getting less tolerant of all kinds of difference and all kinds of, uh, of, 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 of differences between people. But it's certainly the kind of thing that you or I would have grown up with, you know, where our mothers were saying, well, you know, you, you, we tell our mothers we don't feel terribly well today. And, she, and our mothers would say, well, you're going to school anyway. Um, this notion that infections are something, minor infections are things that you can live with. Um, you know, they may be a nuisance, they're a nuisance, but we shouldn't necessarily expect to do anything about it. And, uh, you know, and that sort of shifting into well, if we can do something about it, we must. So we can't tolerate COVID infection in children, although all the evidence is that COVID infection, particularly in under 12s, but also in healthy teenagers, you know, is for the most part a mild phenomenon. You know, yeah. they will feel a bit rough for a few days and they will get over it and they will have durable immunity as a result of it. Yeah. Is is a natural immunity uh, advantageous to children? Do you think it's in a way better for young non-risk people to have a natural infection? Would that be perhaps a way to go for them? Well, I think it's premature to say that uh, definitively, but clearly there are immunologists who are pointing to the fact that younger children, have, their immune systems work very differently from yours and mine because every infection for them is a novel infection and their their immune systems are designed in ways that uh, are, are more flexible and more adaptive they're, they're not designed but the in, their immune systems are more flexible and more adaptive um and so if you expose them to a virus um then they <clears throat> will develop a strong memory a strong immune memory for it um now i don't think we conclusively have the evidence for, for for that in relation to COVID, but it would certainly be consistent with what immunologists seem to have accepted for a very long time, that for the most part, you know, we get infections as children, we get a lot of infections as children, which don't greatly bother us, but the the, the stimulation to the immune system, the the the, the memory of those exposures is something that more or less gives us a lifetime of protection. Why would COVID be any different? Now, why you? would COVID be any different? Yeah, so it, it's behaved, it behaves like any other respiratory virus. So one would assume that getting a natural infection, if you're not at risk, would not be would be a good thing. Um, and, and, and what is the danger of trying to stamp out and eliminate infections in those age groups? We come back to something that you were hinting at much earlier on. I mean, the... When, you know, waning applies to all immunity. Um, it just happens more or less slowly in response to different challenges. Um, and so the sorts, but it's then sort of reinforced by, you know, the immunity is reinforced by reinfection, if I can put it that way. Um, and so the with the common cold, for example, um, immunity seems to last for you know one or two years. You know, if you have a if you're exposed to a particular rhinovirus or one of the coronaviruses that causes the common cold, um, you get it and it lasts a couple of years, and then you you kind of get infected again, and it renews the immunity. Um, but that re that cycle of infection and reinfection is is really important for for managing the consequences. And anecdotally, I hear a lot of reports about a so-called sort of super colds going around at the moment. People with respiratory infections, which are not RSV and which are not COVID, but where it looks like the the COVID control measures of last winter have interrupted that cycle of renewal. Now, of course, the danger is that if we get into another winter of restrictions, we don't actually make that better. We make it worse because people are not going to be renewing the immunity and we end up 
in a sense, with even more of a car crash next winter. Um, I mean, do you think we will lock down this winter? And if we do, why will it happen? Well, I see very little appetite for that outside um, a, a, a few outside sort of sections of the sort of biomedical and public health lobby. By lockdown, um, I mean Plan B or whatever. Well, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I'm interested, for example, that the Scottish government sort of went up to the edge on vaccine passport, extending vaccine passports and then backed away. Um, I mean, the Welsh are clearly going down their own path. and But it's... It, I think we you know, we can look at it from England and say, well, you know, where's the evidence that greater restrictions are actually having an impact on rates of infection and hospitalisation and death uh, in the in the other countries of the uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, and 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 given that given that exit strategies are clearly under discussion, I think it's. I think the government would be very reluctant to do anything that looked like a step backwards, particularly if the European data continues to suggest that they made the right call in the summer and sort of took the hit uh, in the late summer and, 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 uh, and early autumn, where most of Europe looks like they're, they're sort of taking it now and, and into the winter when it's, it's going to be much more difficult to deal with. So do you feel that we've reached uh, endemicity with COVID? And in which case, do you think we should just remove all restrictions and all measures? They are still, um, you know, doing lateral flow twice weekly in schools. And uh, there's, you know, um, the idea that vaccine passports could be introduced in this country. Well, it's... I mean, these things are still possible. I wonder how many how many children are actually doing twice weekly lateral flow tests. Uh, a lot of children are. Well, my child was sent home from school last week with a cough, even though she did a negative lateral flow. You know, it depends. It's a patchy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, from what I hear, there's an awful lot of lateral flow tests piled up in you know in people's cupboards. You know, because the kids just don't want to do do it anymore. Um, I think the same is broadly true with this notion that's come out today about well, do a lateral show to shop, a lateral flow test before you go shopping. Um, I, I think, I frankly, find it very hard to see many people you know doing anything with, with that. Um, I mean, part of the problem, Lucy, which again the you know the BMJ editorial this week draws attention to, is that. We have not made the research investment in the NPIs to find out what works. Um, and you know, as you know, Lucy, I've been saying this since last summer. Um, other people have been saying it since last summer. And by that, uh, you mean non-pharmaceutical interventions, yes. all the measures, the restrictions. So we, we actually don't know. What do we know about them? Well, exactly. No. I mean, no. I mean, on. I mean, we keep getting these pronouncements about masks work. You know, the evidence is just not there. The only honest thing you can say about masks is we don't know. If you really push it, you might be able to say, well, there is weak evidence of a very of a possible small benefit. So the studies that show that they prevent uh, infection or they stop this amount of droplets or that amount of are you saying they're poorly designed? They need to be randomized and controlled and community based rather than lab based. Well, yes. If we if we had another hour, Lucy, I'd I'd, I'd sort of take you through the yeah. uh, the flaws in the um, in 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 the testing in, yeah. in, in but, research. But what we have done, we've it, had yeah. opportunities in this country to do randomised controlled trials of mask wearing, which would which could have been better designed, community based, uh, and we we've, we've passed on them. We've we've just not done it, and that and that that is that is unforgivable. So we're making we're making policies on the back of weak un, and uncertain evidence whose application to the community um, is very uncertain, and you cannot use the power of the state to force people to comply with policies on such a flimsy basis. I mean that's just immoral. I mean and. You know, the legal profession ought to be speaking out much more forcefully about that. 
And why do you think they're not? And why do you think there's, you know, so much pushback against lifting of restrictions? What do you think is going on? Well, some of this, again, we've talked about this before, Lucy, some of this is the continuing levels of fear and anxiety, the, you know, the continued strategies to amplify this by, you know, the use of behavioural science techniques, um, the sorts of things that Laura Dodsworth has written about and which will certainly deserve further scrutiny. Yeah, so where should we uh, be going now? How should we be moving with COVID? I, I know that people have said it has an infection to fatality rate, which is similar to seasonal influenza. Um, it, I mean, I, I'm not comparing it to seasonal influenza. It's a different thing. But if that is the case, and is that the case, how should we be moving forward into winter? Well, I think the important thing is making the the cultural shift from seeing COVID as something that is an existential threat, something that is going to cause a large volume of um, of morbidity, of serious illness, um, disabling consequences and deaths, um, and to put it in proportion as another challenge to human societies, to health systems, to medicine, which is comparable in its scale and nature to that of seasonal influenza. Now, clearly there are differences, as you said, Lucy, and we shouldn't necessarily assume that the measures that we've adopted in the past for dealing with seasonal influenza are the measures that we should be adopting in the future. But we should be very clear to justify any differences. You know, we're dealing with two viruses which are substantially transmitted by airborne infection. Um, We have adapted successfully to to living with seasonal influenza uh, over millennia. Um, And there is really no reason why we can't do the same with, with COVID once we start treating it as something that is exceptional. Um, You know, the sorts of of death rates that we are seeing are a fraction of what the pandemic, the influenza pandemic of 1918 brought, or the, you know, the Black Death of medieval Europe. There's some very interesting new work on the 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 so-called plague of Justinian in the 6th century AD, which suggests that that may have had comparable mortality to the Black Death, 30 to 50% of the population. You know, we are not never going to be in that kind of range with COVID. Um, so and should we dismantle the test, track and trace? What should we do with it? How do we live alongside it? What does that look like? Well, what it looks like is not really doing anything very different from flu. Um, uh, flu management, we, we have a surveillance system for respiratory viruses, we, we add COVID to that. We don't need to have a special test and trace and outbreak control system for COVID. Genetic sequencing for variants? Well, we can track variants by the variants that matter are the ones that provoke hospital admissions. <clears throat> we do genotyping on the people who come into hospital. This is the, the uh, ones that are really ill. Yeah. Those are the ones that are really ill. And if we, if, if they, if it turns out that they've got a they've got a new variant, then we you know we might do a bit more digging, but we we will find we will find the new variants quickly enough by just tracking the emissions. And last question: Do you worry that we're going to have some kind of medical apartheid, whether it's imposed from the top or whether it's just because of this sort of neighbourly looking at each other? You're unvaccinated. We have. Um, this feeling of discrimination now, which um, you know you can see it in the media and across Europe, is that is that a concern, especially if we bring in vaccine passports? Well, vaccine passports, I think, would be very damaging, um, <clears throat> and I, I think largely unenforceable, frankly. Why damaging? Uh, well, because of the you know the the friction that they would in, introduce, not necessarily the interpersonal friction, but you know, they would be discouraging people from participating in the everyday life of the society. They'd be damaging for businesses. They'd be damaging for the sorts of social interactions upon which human society depend. If we, you know, if we demand a vaccine passport before we will let any students into a classroom, you know, there'll be some students who miss out on the learning. Um, and, you know, that to me is not acceptable. 
Um, I think that we should, we, we do face this, I think there's much less interpersonal friction out there than you would think if you follow Twitter. I mean, I've, I've not worn a mask anywhere since July, <clears throat> and I've not observed any sort of interpersonal conflict anywhere. You know, you get the stories that, you know, Twitter is a very biased sample of the world, Lucy. And there are um, places that don't want people in and concerts, you know, that you might, well, I think one famous, was it Bruce Springsteen, no one's allowed to my concert without a vaccine part. You know, it is, there is a division in society, whether you like it or not, and that may increase when, with the, you know, winter coming on, we, we're going to have an increase in infections. It, well... We'll wait, let's wait and see about the increase in infections. Um, I think the the one thing that I think we've all got very cautious about is making predictions. Um, I think the you know the issue about venues demanding uh, passport vaccine passports and so on as private initiatives. Uh, I I'm really very skeptical about how far that is sustainable in economic terms. You know the the number of very good reasons why people won't want the hassle um, and will choose to go to unvaccinated venues, especially as much of the tra- much of that traffic is in under 40s who are at intrinsically low risk anyway. Um, I, I find it very hard to see the you know, student night in Nottingham being policed by vac- in, in, you know, with that level of, of severity. Um, winter this winter the NHS and this is my last but you know even if we don't see an increase in COVID infections we will be seeing problems because we have a huge backlog and so how do we manage that and isn't you know that there may be a call for lockdown because of that and we've discussed why that is not a good idea but um, you know what do we do about this problem within the NHS and another whole conversation but not lockdown perhaps is, is locking down might not be the, the simple answer well, what we need, the problems with the NHS are largely the result of a decade of underinvestment. <clears throat> the, you know, the NHS has been funded well below the growth, the, the growth in demand for more than 10 years. Um, you know, it hasn't really been funded at an adequate level since about 2009, 2010. And where it should have been growing at a roughly three to four percent per year to simply to cope with the aging population, it, the the funds going in have been declining. You know, if there is a problem this winter, you know, it's not going to be a COVID problem. COVID restrictions are not going to contribute to resolving that. There may be a respiratory virus problem. Yep. We might get lucky because it seems that the flu vaccine is a good match for the emerging flu strain, um, but. It's it's really a problem about funding, uh, organisation, management in the in the health service, um, and that you know that is the issue that we should be concentrating on, and we should not be restricting the community to solve that problem. Are you going to continue working on this, you know, or are you going to move on to something else now? Oh, I, there are things that I would dearly love to move on to, but um, you know there. There is also a sense in which, you know, this is a moment when, you know, sort of 50 years of studying medical sociology, sociology of law, sociology of science and technology all comes together. And that that is something which I suppose as as an academic, I, I feel some sort of public service duty, if you like, to to make available i mean whether anybody wants to take it up or not is is what they do you can see they have and you've done a lot uh, you've had a lot of massive input um so i i'd like to thank you so much for your um insights and um i think yeah i I can't push you anymore i pushed you as far as i could i'm getting and getting grief from the producers (laughs) leave it so thank you so much (laughs) 